We're now going to start session two, and um, this session will concentrate on the trust special administrator, the TSA, and the evidence that was used, uh, evidence in inverted commas possibly, uh, in considering the, the proposed changes, and was there an alternative plan? So first of all, we're going to hear some videos from community nurses and patients. People with Parkinson's have very severe difficulties with mobility. They're very prone to falls, they're prone to infections, um, and anything else that they have always makes the Parkinson's worse. Now at the moment, because of the integration of services, if a person with Parkinson's is taken to Lewisham Hospital, if something goes wrong with their medication while they're in there with their medication regime or their Parkinson's gets worse, they are also under the neurologist at Lewisham, Professor Chowdhury, who is a world-class expert in this field. And he can intervene with the staff at Lewisham if something's going wrong with their medication. If our people, if our members get taken, say, to Woolwich or Farnborough, those links will be lost. I mean, Lewisham at the moment is integrated with King's College Hospital, which is a European centre of excellence for Parkinson's, and Lewisham Hospital is on the way to becoming a, uh, a centre of excellence. So we're worried about that aspect of it. The other aspect of it that I'm worried about is um, how safe after a f I mean, people with Parkinson's are prone to falling. How safe is it to take somebody who's had a fall, uh, who is dementing, who is immobile, who can't express themselves, to an urgent care centre? You, you don't know. They've, they would have to be taken to an A&E anyway, because, you know, you can't tell from talking to them how badly, badly they're hurt. I mean, my husband has had to go to Lewisham A&E on several occasions, and, um, you know, I have to be there to interpret for him because, you know, the staff can't understand him and so forth. Now, the care we've received at Lewisham has always been excellent. Um, but there's one aspect of, and Lewisham is much easier for us to get to. I mean, this whole thing about Woolwich is only three minutes further away. It's absolutely ludicrous. There are nine bus routes that go to Lewisham. There are two that go to Woolwich. None of them are direct from our part of the world. And the other issue relating to trips to A&E is of hospital transport, which I don't think anybody has really considered. Because when we've had to use hospital transport, uh, you, you have to, you've had several hours wait in a, you know, you've been in A&E for several hours, and then you have to wait for hospital transport, which I believe is supplied by G4S, with that company's usual efficiency. Um, and you have to wait until the, um, the van, you know, is, is the bus, is, is the ambulance, is got its complement of passengers. So after having waited, waited in A&E and been seen to, by this time, you know, the, a person who is very vulnerable and very ill is feeling really tired, really stressed, probably dementing worse than they were before. Then you have a journey of several hours all round the borough, you know, to take people back to their homes. You have to wait until there's enough people to fill up the van. Um, then you have to go round the borough. So, you know, you're at least another hour and a half, say. That's just from Lewisham Hospital. I mean, what is that going to be like? Can you imagine going from Woolwich all round the whole area of South East London? I mean, if these people ever travelled on public transport in South East London or in any, any um, mobility vehicle, they, they don't have a clue. And it makes me very, very angry. I'm completely opposed to the government's proposals to downgrade Lucian's emergency department and maternity services. I believe that they are based on an appalling lack of clinical evidence. I believe that the consultation was a sham. The final proposals for what the government has termed a smaller A&E 
and uh, the midwife-led maternity unit were not in the draft report that were given to the public. So I do not believe that we've been consulted uh, on the proposals. And as uh, one of the four tests that the uh, government has for NHS configuration is a full and proper public consultation, I believe that that test certainly hasn't been met. Um, I have filed two freedom of information requests with the Department of Health. Um, one was to ask what the travel time impact of the proposals would be on Lucian mums having to go elsewhere for maternity services. I received an inadequate response so I filed an internal review and upon receipt of the response to the internal review the Department of Health admitted that they didn't know what the travel time impact would be and they weren't able to point me to any information about that. Uh, I've also got a second freedom of information request which as of today, the 19th of May, is still pending. Uh, that requested the clinical evidence behind Sir Bruce Keogh's claim that 75% of uh, current patients to Lucian's emergency services would still be able to use the department under the new proposals. Uh, the response that I got from the department stated that this, uh, this claim was based on admissions data. I then filed an internal review saying that I wanted more detail on this. And as of today, I think it's been 30 working days since I filed that internal review and I haven't received a response and I should have received it within 20 working days. Well, I've lived in, um, my special interest in Lewisham Hospital is that I've lived here for 14 years now and I believe that Lewisham Hospital is an integral part of our community. It is, sits right in the heart of Lewisham and uh, it, it converge, every area in Lewisham converges in towards the hospital. Um, I believe it's a good hospital, it's, it serves our community well. I very nearly died um, and in January last year, 2012, I was admitted to via A&E to uh, intensive care unit, to the critical care unit, uh, where they looked after me and somehow, with their skills and my determination, um, I'm still here. I've started doing um, freedom of information requests about um, not just A&E, so obviously I'm very concerned about them, um, but also critical care beds, intensive care beds. Um, at the moment, Approximately 18 are to go in Lewisham alone and I imagine that's going to be uh, repeated at 10 or so other hospitals in the London area. I'm only alive because of, of in a critical care bed. So me and 200 other, well, 200 other patients, something like that, where, where would we go? Where would we be? And I think, honestly, I'd be dead. I know I'd be dead. There's no way I could survive um, without a critical care unit. Um, and the other people, the same thing. I think I've had my chance, even though I'm only 52 now, I've, I've, you know, I've had my chance, I've used, my, I've used the critical care bed, but I want others to have that chance should they need it. Other people are going to be um, parents or you know, even if they're not, they're, they're enjoying their life, they're getting on with their life. They should not be um, condemned to die. My name is Shaquille Beg. I'm Imam of Lucian Islamic Centre. I've been Imam here for, four, for 15 years now and part of my work is to teach Arabic, teach Quran, teach Islamic studies, conduct uh, marriages, give counselling, give advice, also youth work and gang mediation. My connection with Lucian Hospital is that I'm a volunteer Muslim chaplain at the hospital which means I uh, engage and deal with staff as well as patients in terms of advising them in, in terms of Islamic issues and their religious needs. Uh, the Muslim community as well as the centre has built a good relationship with Lucian Hospital and the community feels that Lucian Hospital and its staff understand the sensitivities of the Muslim community. Uh, were these individuals from the community to move elsewhere to other hospitals we feel that they will not be able to understand our sensitivities and concerns as Lucian Hospital and the staff of Lucian Hospital understand those sensitivities. 
the response from the community has been very unified and great. The, the different faith communities, as well as other communities, have come together against any changes to Lusham Hospital and any closure to Lusham Hospital. Uh, sadly, the faith communities and the wider uh, co community in the London Borough of Lusham feel that their concerns have not been taken into consideration by the government. Uh, my view of the changes that are proposed is that they um, are frankly dangerous. Um, they will, um, as far as I can see, um, create a situation where there's going to be thousands of people needing emergency medical help or help with more chronic conditions who are, there's just not going to be a place for babies to be born, there is not going to be a space or a place for people to have their accident emergency um, you know, needs met because already the surrounding hospitals are at, at uh, seemingly breaking point. Already the system is at breaking point and Lewisham is existing. So you doubt whatever you want to, term you want to use, downgrade it is I think a kind term, dismantle most of the acute services in, in Lewisham, leaving the borough with nothing but a rump of an urgent care centre plus one consultant that ambulances will not visit. So the ambulance services are going to have to do longer and longer journeys, which reduces the number of patients they can care for. Thank you. Di Middleton will now get to her feet, and you know what that means. Jeremy Hunt is about to speak to you. Minister, we know that the Trust Special Administrator, uh, Matthew Kershaw, has proposed major changes in his report, and you have decided to implement those changes. Was that a difficult decision for you? It would be totally irresponsible for me as Health Secretary to fail to take a decision that could save as many lives as I believe this decision will save. If we are to save more lives in A&E and reduce the number of maternity deaths in London, it involves taking difficult decisions. In real terms, how many lives will be saved? These proposals, as amended, could save up to 100 lives every year through higher clinical standards. Uh, the independent clinical review conducted by Sir Bruce Keogh uh, addressed the issue of local patient care. Um, how significant was the input of that review with regard to the saving of lives? In the end, the things that matter most are the clinical considerations. I thought it was extremely important to take advice from the NHS medical director, Sir Bruce Keogh, and I have taken that advice. He is absolutely clear that this will save lives, which is my biggest responsibility. Were there any alternative proposals which could properly address uh, the problems? Matthew Kershaw looked extensively at whether there was an option within South London Healthcare NHS Trust to solve the problem. He invited expressions of interest from other people who might run the hospitals in the group, but nobody was able to come forward with a proposal that would solve the problems within the geographical confines of the Trust. In, in, indeed, nobody, uh, not the Labour Party nor any of the people who oppose these changes, has come forward with a proposal that would not impact on the neighbouring healthcare economies. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. John O'Donoghue. Could you please, for the Commission, give your name and your qualifications? Yes, my name is John O'Donoghue. I'm a physician working at Lewisham Hospital. And what is your current uh, role? I, as a physician in Lewisham Hospital, I'm 
one of a number of uh, doctors, senior doctors, consultants who look after patients admitted through the A&E department at Lewisham Hospital. And these would be cases such as pneumonia, uh, headaches, infections, um, which come under medicine rather than surgery or gynaecology. So as part of your role, part of your task overseeing admissions, um, which uh, departments and professionals would you be dealing with on a regular basis? Well, um, when patients come by ambulance or on foot to A&E, um, there's no way of predicting uh, which um, specialist services they will need. Um, a significant amount would need coronary care, the specialist services there. A significant amount would need intensive care with the backup of the critical care physicians and also the, um, the anaesthetists that that entails. Um, we also regularly have need to call the obstetricians or gynaecologists um, to see patients who are pregnant. Thank you. Could I ask you to um, face out to the audience and to the panel when you're giving your answers? That would be helpful. Thank you. Um, so I'm not in court. <laughs> <laughs> I was play acting being on the stand. I was quite enjoying myself there. <laughs> um, so um, can you um, explain then to the Commission um, what, in your view, um, would be the impact of the TSA proposals on your department? Well, the um, acute physician role that I undertake um, would, to all intents and purposes, disappear on the Lewisham Hospital site. Um, we couldn't run um, um, acute medical service um, in the absence of the backup facilities that lie behind the front door of the a &E department. Um, the, the, the slim down, um, small but safe A&E that was part of the amended proposals, um, there are no details um, that have crystallized behind that, but it's likely that this will not involve um, intensive care staying at Lewisham um, or those extra specialist services that I've mentioned that are so vital uh, to run acute medical emergency service. So would you just like to, in a nutshell, set out what you understand to be the small and safe option? Well, this is a, um, it depends, it's stretching the definition of an A&E, um, um, which would have these support services um, behind us to support patients who come in by ambulance. Um, it's unlikely that uh, this, this, this um, smaller A&E would be open to ambulances. Um, it's um, likely that it would be, to all intents and purposes, a minor injuries unit uh, for, uh, for patients um, who wouldn't require urgent admission. Um, so, like many minor injuries departments, um, patients would only go to it if, if they knew there was a, uh, no serious possibility that the condition would need uh, admission. Our GPs who saw patients um, at their home would not direct patients to it. So, as has happened in other parts of London, there's a very real possibility that this would lead to a, a, a big decline in the hospital and the services it provides, and a attrition of staff who would leave, um, patients who would um, be reluctant to use a, a hospital with only a minor injuries department. Um, because if you're, if, if you're a patient in the middle of the night with a headache and you fear the worst, and, and, and I've done that for um, my own family, um, do you want to go to a hospital where uh, the staffing is, is, is an extended um, uh, nurse practitioner, not an A&E? Um, specialist and there's no um, surgical um, backup or uh, intensive care backup or for a child paediatric backup? The answer is, is uh, probably no in many cases. And so you're saying effectively that people would be turned away? Um, in a minor injuries unit or a smaller A&E, um, there would definitely have to be rules uh, um, uh, to um, limit the severity of, of, of illness in a patient's the patients who turn up because um, it wouldn't make sense to have um, patients having a cardiac arrest with no cardiac arrest team. Um, so um, patients would be told that this is um, not a full-fledged A&E and the London Ambulance Service would be probably not calling at its door. So there presumably then wouldn't it be no access to intensive care either? Um, those details haven't been 
completely ironed out. Um, it, it's, it's, um, that's a very expensive facility and um, one which, uh, um, you know, if patients aren't, aren't going to be admitted um, from the AD department or what's called the AD department um, to, to the hospital, then there would be no rationale to have an intensive care to support those patients. Thank you. Now, you've heard the Minister, uh, his claim that proposals will save up to uh, 100 lives a year. Can you explain where this figure comes from? We did challenge um, the Secretary of State and S Sir, Professor Sir Bruce Kehoe um, on this figure. Um, and I'm disappointed to say that um, the response from uh, uh, Bruce Kehoe uh, contained the phrase, this is not an exact science. I think, <laughs> and before I go into the details of the statistical um, heresy that, 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 that under, underpins this claim, um, we, events have moved on. We've had uh, Sir Bruce Kehoe's other predictions of mortality uh, since then uh, um, in the Leeds cardiothoracic case, I think, that can only serve to undermine, really, uh, his role in this. And also, we have had a direct uh, experience of the closure of uh, an AD department in England. A Freedom of Information request for Newark AD showed that the death rate for patients living in Newark um, who had to be shipped to a neighboring A&E when Newark AD closed rose by 25%. So that. So, so can I just interrupt you there? So you're saying you're going to come to what's wrong with those figures? Absolutely. But what you're saying is that now there is now empirical evidence which undermines that claim. Since the Secretary of State's decision, um, those two pieces of evidence have come to light. And going back to uh, the Secretary of State's claim that 100 lives will be saved, um, if you go into the basis for this, it all hangs on uh, research. Um, from nearly 10 years ago, from 2004. And this research looked at emergency admissions um, in England over a period of one year. And they found that patients coming in at the weekend um, had a mortality that was higher than patients who were admitted um, during the week. And they made the sort of heroic um, claim from that evidence that this meant that patients weren't properly being looked after at the weekend and therefore they were more likely to die as a result of that. If you go into the actual uh, academic paper, um, the authors themselves, some, themselves actually con uh, concede that there is uh, another potential explanation for this. And I, 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 I ask you to look at a patient admitted at the weekend. In fact, when they looked at the patients admitted at the weekend, only um, three quarters of, in, in any 24 hour period um, of the numbers of patients were admitted at the weekend compared to the weekdays. Um, and these patients um, admitted at the weekends were sicker to start with. So you're um, saying that one explanation for the, for, the, for the figures is that the patients were actually sicker when they were admitted. Were there any other specific explanations for the figures that you can think of? The, well, I, think I want to expand on, on, on yes. that one a bit more Sorry. because that's, a, that's an important one. Um, if we take it that emergency admissions aren't always um, delivered to hospital in ambulance um, in severe cases such as a severe heart attack or a stroke, um, you would think that their admission will be spread evenly throughout the week. But they are only a minority of cases. Um, 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 in fact, it's more likely to see, you're more likely to see admissions um, who come in from GP practices, who come in from hospital clinics, um, patients whose decision to admit through A&E is sometimes a little bit marginal. And of course, the uh, hospital clinics and the GP surgeries tend to operate during the week. Um, so patients um, will often tough it out over the weekend and come in on Monday. So the patients admitted at the weekend are a selected bunch um, of patients who are often sicker and are quite likely to have a higher mortality to start with. And just ex to expand on that, I'll take an extreme example, patients admitted on Christmas Day. Yes. Christmas Day is a day nobody wants to end up spending in A&E. Um, we know that patients admitted on Christmas Day um, um, have a higher mortality because they're sicker to start with. And this is what we're seeing in this paper. And this is the basis of the whole premise that 100 lives will be saved. What the paper showed was that the excess mortality at the weekends was 3,300 for England. And they broke this down on the back of an envelope and calculated that for the southeast of London, 
pro rata, this would be 100 lives. And this is the basis for the whole clinical justification that the Secretary of State has made. Now, um, what arrangements had, uh, have, has Lewisham already made to um, separate off those conditions which would benefit from specialist rather than um, speedy intervention? Yes, this, this brings me back to um, the other flaw in the, in the argument, which I think you were um, driving towards with your la last question. Um, since we, we, we do know that for some conditions, um, um, centralised um, um, care is, is better, and that's why since 2009, um, all patients with strokes have been centralised. They haven't been coming to Lewisham, they've been com coming to King's or to Princess Royal and Farnborough. So that's 2011. But 2009, um, all heart attacks have been diverted either from A&E in Lewisham or by the London Ambulance Service to specialised heart attack centres. And we know this improves, um, um, the, 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 the centralisation of these has resulted in a better mortality for stroke and heart attack. But they're the only situations where this applies. Um, so could I just ask you then, what impact will these changes have on um, patients for whom speed is of the essence? Well, the, um, an example of that is meningitis, where it's been shown that um, what, what's important for meningitis is the speed um, you get antibiotics into the patient, not where it's delivered. And um, so um, the Secretary of State made a, a very surprising claim in his speech uh, when he announced his decision that meningitis patients would benefit. Um, that's completely co uh, contradicted by these specialist societies Indeed. and the evidence. And so you've heard the government soundbite. What soundbite might you prefer? Well, I think Lewisham lives will be lost by this. Um, the fact that you can close a successful solvent district general hospital with uh, care that's deeply rooted in the community, as we've seen from the last um, video, and, and with above average, uh, better than average mortality, um, and just replace that somewhere else, I think that's a very dangerous leap of faith. Thank you very much, Dr. Donahue. Could I ask you just to stay there in case the Commission has any questions? Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Donald O'Sullivan. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Can I ask you to tell uh, this commission your name, please? My name is Donald O'Sullivan. And your qualifications? I'm a consultant in public health medicine. And where do you currently, where is your role currently carried out? Um, I work for the London Borough of Lewisham um, in the public health department there, and I'm responsible for advising the council and indeed the clinical commissioning group on the um, quality of maternal and child health services. Uh, I'm going to ask you a series of questions around uh, each of those uh, services. First of all, um, what is said currently about the services that are provided for children in Lewisham? Well, firstly, I would say that I think objectively and, and by however you rate the services for children in Lewisham, particularly the hospital services, but also community child health services, um, I think they're of a very high standard. I think it's a real boon to Lewisham children that we have a service of this standard in our local trust. And, and this service delivers, um, particularly through uh, community child health services, but also and critically through the uh, children's uh, consultant-led A&E service and indeed the, ho the hospital service. Can you, can you just expand upon that? An integrated children's services is, service is what uh, Lewisham has at current, yeah. currently. Well, well, that's absolutely right. I mean, one, one, of the recent, one of the developments over recent years is the, is the um, emergence of the single trust and a truly integrated children's service. Um, though always well integrated, the hospital and community services are now part of the same organization which does carry a, a, an additional advantage. Um, one of the main things for me and one of the main risks as I see it in terms of the implementation of the TSA proposals is the loss of that integration yes. um, and indeed also we've also got to bear in mind that maternity services are part of the same trust. Oh, come, um, coming on to that, but can, yeah. can you help the, the uh, Commission with this? 
What effect has the uh, integrated children's services had on admissions for children to hospital? Well, particularly, when I, one of the first things I discovered um, when I first took up the responsibility in relation to um, the public health aspects of child health in Lewisham, one of the things I discovered was that the admission rate of, for children in Lewisham was much lower than we would expect, uh, per, particularly given, um, given the, the level of disadvantage in the local population. Um, and in, in fact, it was about, it was less than 70%, the admission rate was less than 70% of what we would expect. And I, I was kind of puzzled by this and, and wondered what the reasons for this might be, because the levels of need locally are quite high. One of the things I, I felt sure about was that the, uh, one of the things I thought might be an explanation rather, was that the consultant-led nature of the service meant that children were much more likely to get a high level of assessment and where junior doctors could be supported by a consultant in a decision to discharge where the child would be actually managed at home by, by their parents or carers. And in fact, I felt we, we thought we should explore this a little bit more and, and uh, we were lucky to have a, a, a trainee in our department who was doing her MSc at the time. She did her dissertation looking at admission rates throughout the country and related those to whether or not there was a consultant-led children's A&E department was able to show that there was a significant association between having a consultant-led um, A&E department and low admission rates. Uh, uh, and that's very, very clear. It's a very clear association. So can I then ask you to just explain to the Commission, under the TSA proposals, what it would look like um, well, in the event that Lewisham were Well, as Dr. O'Donoghue explained in relation to the adult side, I think the children's side would be very similar. Uh, there would be an ambulatory care uh, department for, um, for children, um, and that might well be consultant-led. However, it's almost the sort of definition of an, an ambulatory care department is that patients seen there are much less likely to be admitted yes. and indeed if they if somebody who requires admission is seen there it's almost a failure of of the triage by the ambulance service that they've arrived there um, so that then I think it would be necessary for the new trust the combined trust to actually have all the inpatient provision at Greenwich um, and therefore I think it would be, they, they would, the consultants, it would be very inefficient probably it, to have a consultant-led service just for ambulatory care at Lewisham Hospital, which would in the end mean, I think, that most, most parents would probably take their children to, to Greenwich if they could, you know. But it, would it be an integrated service or would it be fragmented? Well, I think it would still be integrated in that um, the service at Greenwich and the service at Lewisham would be run by the same trust and would have the same individuals in it. But the, the local focus in Lewisham would be much less and parents would find it much more difficult to access a full consultant-led service. Will it be safe for the children of Lewisham? Uh, um, I think I'm confident of the people who would be running this that they would make it safe. Um, I'm confident that the people um, working within the trust at present who would be working within these new arrangements would make these arrangements safe. My, diff my worry is that far more parents will find it much more difficult to take their child to a, to a consultant-led full a &E service and, um, and that will cause problems for them and for their children. Mm. Can I move on to the maternity services within Lewisham? Yeah. Um, can you tell the Commission what is said about the current service that's provided to mum, uh, would be mums in? Uh, well, the, cur the current service is, is, pop is increasingly popular, I think it's fair to say. I think certainly the, the new um, midwifery led birth centre <coughs> is, is cherished by uh, local users, uh, local women in particular. Um, and I think over uh, the years, uh, a lot has been done to make the service um, of much higher quality and is much more highly rated by women. Uh, you've been part of that uh, well, yes, we're, I mean, commissioning. I, I, I think we've, we've had a very effective collaboration between um, formerly the PCT, now the CCG, the Trust and indeed the Public Health Department yes. um, to, to, um, to enhance the service that exists in Lewisham. So can I then ask you how that service, will, what it will look like under the TSA proposals, which is a single... Okay. Mind if I just have a... Of course. 
what, what it would look like for, for um, well, my, my main concern is, is essentially that we, about capacity generally. I think within the sector at present, we have, we're constantly on the bones of not having enough beds and not having enough capacity to deliver a safe service. That's in the, in the whole sector. So if you look at all the trusts in South East London, over a period of 18 months where we looked at this, they actually, on average, each month, at at least two of those units had to close on at least one occasion. And that's almost always because of beds, because of lack of capacity. Um, we are also, as a sector, highly dependent on Darrant Valley Hospital, where many women from Bexley now go to have their babies. And Darrant Valley is itself um, experiencing problems because of capacity. So that I think we're on the brink of a major problem with capacity in maternity services in South East London. To actually alter that at this time, or to interfere with that, I think, is fraught with danger, mm. I think. And I, I'm not entirely sure that enough thought has been given to that at all in these proposals. The second issue that I worry about is that the proposals are um, clearly assume that most of the flow will go to Greenwich. There's no evidence for that that I can see. Um, women in Lewisham, historically, if they haven't chosen Lewisham Hospital, have gone to King's or have gone to Guy's and Thomas's, with a small number in the south of the borough going to Princess Royal. What um, it, 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 I'm fairly confident that women will find it an incre incredibly difficult to have to go to Greenwich, and most will actually go elsewhere. So we've actually looked, one of the things we did is we looked in detail at the flows and at the potential future flows. And we believe that, that in fact most women will go to King's or St. Thomas's. And we believe that that will mean that these hospitals will become very large in terms of the size of their maternity service. So large that they'll have to, if you like, double up their provision, particularly um, in relation to provision of the, of the obstetric roles, which will make this a much more expensive service. That's also, of course, assuming that both of these hospitals have the capacity to extend uh, their, their service. King's, for instance, is, a, is on a very restricted site geographically, um, so there are all sorts of pressures, I think, on King's. Now, ha have the, what, what you're saying, has this, in fact, been looked at by uh, the government when it came to make these proposals? for both children's services and maternity services? Yeah. Is it evidence-based? Is this evidence-based? I, I think it's difficult for me to, say, to answer that because I've never had a really meaningful dialogue. I've submitted what I feel um, is reasonable evidence contrary to the, point they've, the points they've made and the assumptions they're making, and I've not ever really had, in my view, a satisfactory response. Um, so I can't say that they're evidence-based. Um, but, but will these uh, new uh, proposals, or the proposals, it, is it going to result in a, in a safer uh, uh, system for, uh, for children and return to services in Lewisham, or is it likely to be yeah. uh, less on, safe? On the maternity side, I think, as I said, I think there's a huge risk that if we don't manage any change properly, um, it will be unsafe. Children will be born in transit and there are all sorts of problems associated with that. Just on the 100 lives argument, I mean, I think to, br to bring maternal mortality into this discussion is actually incredibly artificial. Maternal death is a very rare event in this country and we would, I think, to have it even one would be a disaster. Um, I don't believe there is any evidence to support the idea that larger maternity services are safer, are less likely to result in maternal mortality, um, nor do I believe there is any evidence that, that they're better quality. In fact, there's some evidence to suggest that they're of poorer quality, and certainly women um, find them less their, women are less satisfied with those services. So the idea of, of moving to a larger service for maternity really con, con, comes with no benefit as far as I can see at all. From your experience and from your, the work that you've been doing, what do you say the government should be doing in relation to services for both children and uh, maternity? 
Well, <laughs> I think with children in particular, I think there is a real anxiety amongst many that we're not providing as good a service for our children as a country as we should be. We know that the mortality of children in the UK is higher than in other countries, other developed countries. There is some evidence to suggest that that is about the way we organize and provide our pediatric services. Um, I don't believe that changing services in this way is going to go anywhere towards addressing that issue. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Sorry. There are a couple of questions, one from me and one from my fellow judge here, Blake Morrison. Um, it might help if you have in front of you the folder we have, which have documents in it. Um, because one of the documents, and I don't think those who are here will necessarily have it, so... Which document is it? It's tab four, a letter addressed to you uh, from the Professor... NHS Medical Director, dated the 13th of February. Do you have that? No, that's addressed to Dr. O'Donoghue. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, can I just ask you about this? Because um, you will know about some of the points that are... Did you ever receive a copy of this? I'm not sure that I have. It doesn't well, look points I just want to ask you about... Hmm are these. First of all, it's clear in this letter, and I'm just going to read out a paragraph. Mm. I want to make it very clear that I was not asked to provide a judgment on the quality of health care in your hospital. And this has not been called into question, either within the TSA report or in any advice I have provided to the Secretary of State. Mm. Now, is that your understanding, that there has been absolutely no criticism of any deficiency or any shortcoming in the health care provided by the hospital by any single quarter? Yes. Right, first question. Second question, that in fact the decision to trigger the regime was taken in the light of serious concerns that if the financial problems were not tackled, there would eventually be significant impact on the quality of care for patients which make up the SLHT. Of course, Lewisham's not part of that. That's correct. And is it your understanding that the financial problems not being tackled were created by the government themselves? Well, well the financial problems are not in Lewisham Healthcare Trust. Quite. And that's, I suppose, the, most, the, the strongest point uh, to me, that it seems extraordinary that this trust is drawn in to the problems of another. Uh, and, and certainly those problems were not of Lewisham's creation. Now, at the last page, third point, the last page, I <coughs> in terms of reconfiguration, what is being claimed here, that it will only happen if clinical colleagues across the different hospital sites are heavily involved in the design and delivery of any changes. H are you aware of anybody across the sites being involved in the design and delivery of the changes? Certainly not up to the point that the... Um, the um TSA's recommendations went to the Secretary of State. Um, I think we did have a consultation days where clinicians were um, consulted with on the changes, but not in relation to the, the design of the future changes. Right, thank you. Uh, another yeah, question? Uh, I just had a question about maternal deaths. Um, as well as his figure of saving 100 lives a year, Jeremy Hunt says here in, um, in, in, the, in the House of Parliament, that closing the children's department here will lead to fewer maternal deaths in Lewisham yeah. and South East London. Now, I'm pretty sure I've seen a figure amongst this bundle that says there has not been a maternal death in Lewisham for seven years. I wondered if you could confirm s that. S that's certain. There has been one, but one that hadn't been seen at all by any service. Um, and so during the whole of the rest of that time, there's, there's not been uh, that seven year period, there hasn't been a maternal death that's been of a woman known to the service. Thank you. Thank you.
Tim Higginson. Could you confirm your full name, please? Tim Higginson. And Mr. Higginson, what is your role? I'm the Chief Executive of Lewisham Healthcare NHS Trust. And could you please describe what your responsibilities entail? Well, the organisation is in business to provide healthcare, so um, I am accountable for the quality and range of services that we provide uh, and for the resources that we use. Who are you accountable to? Well, I'm accountable to the Trust Board, which consists of executive and non-executive directors, but there are a range of other organisations and agencies uh, to which I'm also accountable. And um, which of those agencies that the Trust is held to account to? Uh, well, we're held to account by the uh, National Trust Development <laughs> Authority, known as the NTDA, um, which looks after all non-foundation trusts in England. Uh, there's the Care Quality Com Commission, which licenses us to provide services and can inspect us. Uh, and our commissioners, both NHS England and also our local clinical commissioners here in the borough. Uh, last and not least, uh, in a very important but less formal way, uh, we are accountable to the local community, to the public, and to the patients that we serve. And you speak about the patients that you serve. Who are those people? They are principally the residents of the London Borough of L Lewisham, but in some services we also uh, provide services to a wider range, and I think a point has already been made in that uh, if you are in the borough and you need urgent or emergency care, uh, then currently the likelihood is um, that you will come to Lewisham. And how, how would you describe that community? What sort of people do make up that community? Uh, the borough has a younger population. It's a very diverse population. Uh, and it's also a population which has um, some groups and some areas of deprivation and need. And what do you say is at the core of the service that you provide for those people? Well, the core of the service is to meet their uh, lo local needs, um, which will be expressed um, by themselves, but also by the commissioners uh, who contract with us on their behalf. Uh, it's full range of services for local people, uh, clearly for more specialised services. Um, we are part of a pathway which sees those patients being treated in other organisations too. Now in the time that you have been Chief Executive since March 2008, um, what is your view as to the change in the range and the quality of services that you provide? Well, in terms of the range of services, probably the most significant change uh, was when we were um, selected uh, as the organisation to provide the community health services in the borough. Um, the Commission will have heard of that earlier. It makes us an integrated organisation um, providing uh, hospital and out-of-hospital care. In terms of quality, uh, all the staff in the organisation have worked hard, um, certainly during my time here, uh, to improve the quality of what they provide. So in terms of examples of, of how that quality has improved and the range of services has improved, uh, how women giving birth, women choosing to have their babies, how has that changed over the years? Uh, well, we have seen an increase uh, in the number of mums who want to come and have their uh, baby uh, in services provided by the Trust. Um, they are an extremely uh, discerning clientele, and I would regard that as a significant mark of improvement that more mums want to come to have their baby. You will already have heard 
uh, of the outstanding reputation of children's services, which are actually borough-wide, um, but the Trust is very proud to play its part in maintaining that reputation. And what about the performance of your A&E department against national targets? Uh, during my time uh, in the Trust, um, the hospital has an excellent record uh, of meeting the targets and standards that have been set for it. Uh, those um, targets and those standards become very difficult at particular times of year, notably in winter, uh, but the team in the department and the backup team um, throughout the hospital, because a, a large number of people are involved in, in supporting this pathway of care, um, have enabled us to maintain that high standard and hit those targets. So, Mr Higginson, is it, is it a fair summary to say that you are extremely proud of your excellent record of improving care and meeting targets? I'm very proud of that record. Uh, turning to the Trust Special Administrator's appointment and report, what was your response to that decision? Well, we were not surprised um, that action was taken with regard to the South London Trust because the problems the organisation was facing uh, were well known and well publicised. Um, what we were surprised at is when it became clear during the course of the TSA's work um, that we were regarded as central to the solution in terms of service changes that were being proposed. And what was your involvement in the programme of work established by the TSA? Uh, I took part in the programme of work along with other senior staff uh, from the organisation and indeed other staff um, from the other six boroughs which together make up what the NHS likes to call South East London. The, the proposals were issued for consultation and the Trust Board submitted its response on the 12th of December 2012. What were the main points of your response? The main points were that we were concerned at the proposed service changes and we went through those in some detail. Um, we did recognise that difficult decisions would need to be made to ensure that we could maintain and improve service quality um, while at the same time keeping within the resource envelope that was available. Um, we did in fact see merit in joining with Queen Elizabeth Ho uh, Hospital because we felt that would give us a better chance in some areas to meet the standards that we were being set. But in general terms, uh, we believed it was important for the local uh, partners in the provision of uh, health and social care to work together um, to identify how that should be done. And so bringing, bringing what you've said together, the three particular key points I want to ask you about. The, the first is your view as to the financial viability and how the trust is doing. What do you say on that? Uh, of, of the trust at the point at which the TSA... Yes. Um, well, we were on course to um, become a foundation trust. Uh, we had submitted our application uh, to the then London Strategic Health Authority uh, and it was passing through them to the Department of Health. Uh, and certainly at that time, um, perhaps the key consideration uh, was a demonstration of financial viability. And in your role as Chief Executive and your experience, how does Lewisham tackle problems? How do you resolve matters? Uh, the borough, um, the community in Lewisham has a strong record uh, of tackling its problems together and tackling them successfully. Um, partnership working means that you don't just agree in the good times, uh, but you also need to work through and agree in the difficult times. And I certainly have been very proud to be part of a community uh, which has always prided it itself on doing that. And, and very finally, Mr Higginson, were you asked to put forward an alternative plan? Uh, we were invited to um, submit an expression of interest 
by the TSA uh, as part of the preparatory work. Uh, and we did express interest. Um, we said that um, we uh, could see merit in coming together with the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and we outlined, but only in outline, um, what we would do uh, to ensure that that organization would be successful, both in terms of providing the right standards of care, but also living it w within the resources available. And what happened to that suggestion, that proposal on your part? It was not taken up. Thank you very much. There may be some more questions for you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. The expression of interest I think we would be interested in uh, is that contained in a publicly available document? Uh, that was in a uh, letter which I wrote at the time. Um, there was um, confidentiality uh, because uh, this was seen as um, a confidential part of the TSA's work. What I will need to check is whether that confidentiality lasted only for the purposes of the TSA exercise and whether that is now available, but I will happily check. I'll, I wonder if you could very kindly yeah. check that, and, and if it's available, may we have a copy, please? Indeed. Thank you. It's page 43, as I understand. Oh, you is, seem is to have here? it already. In, in the documents bundle or the other one? In the witness bundle. That, is that headed executive summary? Is uh, that no, it? that's not the letter. That's not the letter, I no. I, I did check what documents we do have. I can't see the letter no. there. So perhaps this could be sorted out so we can yes. have a copy. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.